You're listening to the Elvis Ultimate Fan Channel Podcast, the channel that is devoted 100% to the life and career of the biggest selling recording artist of all time, with your host, Steve Francis. Hi everyone, welcome once again to Elvis the Ultimate Fan Channel. Just a little reminder that you can join me live every Sunday on the YouTube channel when we talk about all things Elvis and we have a Elvis quiz with a monthly prize. A new feature on the show is Elvis Song of the Week, so I hope you can join me on Sunday. Ginger Alden was Elvis Presley's fiancée at the time of his death. She was the last person to speak to him before he passed away in his bathroom at his Graceland home. Many stories about their relationship have appeared during the years following Elvis's untimely death. I'm delighted to say Ginger has agreed to speak with me today about her time with Elvis and to address some of those rumours and stories. Hi Ginger, you're very welcome to the show. Hi Steve, thank you so much. Happy to be here. It's my pleasure. Now, uh, I was looking on the news there a couple of weeks ago and I saw that some states in America had some really, really bad weather, especially Texas. But what about Tennessee? Was Tennessee bad? Yes, we we uh, we got hit. We didn't have snow as deep as Texas. Uh, and you don't usually hear about the snow in Texas. But uh, we had some ice and snow for quite a few days there. But uh, I was lucky. I still kept my electricity. But Some people, I know Dallas had it uh, pretty bad. I have a niece who lives in Dallas, so they were without electricity for quite a while. But and then the rain came, and now we're uh, inching our way into spring. So it's much better now. Thank you. It can't come soon enough. You know, um, I must admit now, November, December, and January is they're they're always my least favorite months. I'm never, I'm never sorry to, I'm never sorry to see January uh, go anyway. That's for sure. Right. I was wondering how it is in Ireland this time of year. Um, it rains a lot. It rains a lot. Okay. <laughs> so, That's but why it's uh, so pretty and green. <laughs> yeah, ex- exactly. Don't let that put you off not coming, though. You know, you, you'll be <laughs> well, very, you'll be I very welcome you. when you come over. <laughs> right. So, uh, some of our listeners might think that your uh, family's involvement with Elvis was just the nine months that you were with him, from November '76 to August '77. Um, but your connection, your family's connection with Elvis goes back as far as, what, 1958? Would that be correct? Yes. Yes, my, uh, my father was a sergeant uh, in the Army, and uh, he worked with the draft board, and he was also involved in public relations for the Army. And he was at uh, Kennedy Veterans Hospital when Elvis was inducted. Okay, and, and that would have been, what, March 1958? 1958. So, and, and your, your father just kind of, welcomed him well he probably welcomed all the recruits that day not just Elvis yes yes he 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 was able to speak with a lot of the new recruits and uh there was a photo taken of Elvis with my father and I love to look at it it's like wow you know what are the odds of that years earlier and uh um it was funny after my father was speaking um Elvis asked him about getting changed because he wanted to use a payphone and my father reached in his pocket and handed Elvis a dime and uh, uh, and then my father, that I guess that same day, he was able to get two photos signed by Elvis for uh, one of my sisters and for my brother. And uh, he also wrote inside my sister's autograph book, Today I Shook the Hand of Elvis Presley. <laughs> so that was, that was a cool story. I remember him telling us that. And um, yeah, so... Uh, yeah, he, my father, he he would stop by Graceland uh, on different occasions, hoping uh, for some public relations tidbits. This was after Elvis was out of the army. Yes. And uh, just for some little follow-up stories, and he saw Elvis in his driveway talking to a young man one day who had been in a motorcycle accident earlier. Yes. And Elvis noticed my father. He had remembered him from earlier when he was inducted, and he asked the guard to let him in. And so my father was able to get some little public relations tidbit stories that that particular day so that was neat and then the first time you actually met elvis you were probably too young to remember too much about it because you you were only five (laughs) years old right right yes um on my father's visits when he would go to get little public relations tidbits uh, little elvis pieces uh he became friendly with a guard at the gate Uh, uh it was elvis's uncle a man named travis smith and Travis Smith later invited my family 
to join Elvis uh, because Elvis used to take these trips to the fairgrounds and keep the fairgrounds open at night and take a lot of his friends. And uh, so my whole family was uh, invited one evening and I was five when I went that night. And I just remember Elvis, uh, when I saw him, it was amazing. I, I, I didn't quite know who he was, but I, I had some, my sister had some record sleeves at home and I remember seeing his picture and thinking he's got to be somebody famous. I remember seeing people shake his hands and, uh, but he, he was introduced. Uh, we got introduced to him that night and, and, um, he patted me and my sister Terry on our head. And and that's sort of really all you can remember because at five years of age, it's 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 hard to remember uh, yeah, a lot of I, things. Yeah, I had to ask my parents and or ask my sisters about that night because they remembered it better than than I did. Mm. But uh, mm. yeah, that is always a, a nice nice little added story as yeah. well. Yeah, and then uh, obviously you you did your schooling and uh, so forth. What what did you what did you do at school? Well, I loved art. And I always loved singing. I took voice lessons when I was younger, but uh, I really loved art, hoped to be an artist. And uh, when I graduated from school, I went to art school for a year. And uh, my sister, Terry, was a great pianist. And um, she had been involved in, uh, we have local pageants here, and she uh, entered uh, what was called the Miss Memphis pageant. And she won that. And then later she won the Miss Tennessee pageant. Mm-hmm. Uh, so and that was going to go to the Miss America pageant later on. So that was how, uh, that's my little bit on my sister's background, my sister Terry. And she, 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 yeah, she won Miss Memphis in 1976. Yes. And then she went on to win Miss Tennessee that same year. Yeah. And she suggested that you enter the Miss Tennessee pageant. Is that correct? It was a Tennessee universe pageant. Yeah. Uh, which is funny because the, the the Miss Tennessee pageant goes to the Miss America pageant. And Miss Tennessee Universe goes to the uh, uh, Miss USA pageant. So um, I didn't win. I was Miss. I was first runner up. But I thought that would have been wild because my sister, if I had won, my sister would have been going to Miss America, and I would have been going to Miss USA the same year. Mm. Mm. Yeah. And then obviously uh, the call came in from uh, was it George Klein? that uh, Elvis wanted yes. to meet uh, Terry. Yes. And and it was a little awkward. My sister Terry had a boyfriend, and I was seeing someone at the time as well. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, uh, the three of us happened to be home on November 19th, which was unusual for, all, for us to be home that evening. We were usually out socializing or doing something. But George Klein, Elvis's friend George Klein, called our home and said that Elvis was uh, interested in meeting my sister. And it's, when I think back, with my sister, it wasn't that we were thinking, oh, he's seriously, he's going to date her. Nothing wrong with my sister, beautiful lady. But we just thought we were going to finally get to see inside Graceland and take a peek and get to meet Elvis and go home. So uh, we all rushed around and got ready and we were excited and, um, we ended up, uh, I wrote about this in a book I wrote back in 2014 titled Elvis and Ginger. And, yeah. uh, uh, but it, we, it was it was nerve wracking, but we went inside Graceland and the whole evening was magical. And uh, uh, we were eventually taken up. We had to wait on Elvis for a few hours, but we were eventually taken upstairs and into his daughter's bedroom, which I couldn't believe. I didn't even think we'd see upstairs. Mm. And uh, he came walking in the room and I always described it. I was, thought trumpets would sound, and uh, I thought he was gorgeous. And I was very, very shy at the time. And I blurted out, "Hi, Elvis!" Mm. Like I'd known him for a long time. Yeah, and, it was. Uh, it was probably but, yeah, probably nerves. You just thought, "Oh, hi, Elvis!" <laughs> oh, oh, sure. Yeah. And it, it, he was. He was very polite, quite the gentleman. And uh, but as the evening went on, there were little things he did. He was kind of singling me out, and. Um, uh, it, it certainly changed my life after that that night. And uh, you you stayed longer than uh, Rosemary and Terry. Is that correct? Because he, <laughs> he, he he took you into his room and you thought that uh, uh, your sisters were still around, but you were told later that they they'd been taken home. Oh yes, I, I thought they were were still there. So I was really a little scared about <laughs> when he said they'd been sent home. I was, ooh, I'm here by myself. But as I said, he was quite the gentleman. And what fascinated me 
that evening. Uh, we, we read. We read all night long. Uh, or he read, I should say. He handed a book to me and had me read. But he was into um, Eastern philosophy. He had a lot of books that um, he kept by his bedside. And and it was fascinating. I thought it was pretty cool. I said, here I am with this rock and roll superstar, and he wants to read. Yeah, so, um, it it definitely wasn't what most people would think would happen exactly. between uh, exactly. you know a, a rock star and a and a young lady. That's for sure. Um, exactly. So, so, so the, um, what what happened after that first night, that uh, November nineteenth? I went back to see him the next night. He asked for me the next night, and uh, we took a quick trip to Las Vegas which I wrote about in my book, mm -hmm. uh, and I, I was really scared. I'd never been out west before, so it was kind of an a, a, a interesting, interesting trip for me. Uh, but as I said, once again, he was a, he was a complete gentleman. And then after that, um, we about a week later, he called for me to join him on tour, and uh, I flew into San Francisco, and uh, from then on, we began seeing each other. And I only missed, I saw every one of his shows, but about four shows. So I was at all of his concerts. The, the excitement of seeing Elvis sort of, you know, that close, because you, you used to be sort of just, just off to the stage where uh, Felton and the sound engineers were, I think, weren't you? Right, Bruce. Yeah, Bruce Jackson. Bruce Jackson. Uh, yes, he wanted me uh, right behind them. And uh, there was usually a chair put up on the stage uh, for me, and that's where I sat for for usually most of the shows. Every once in a while, it could have been a little little different somewhere, but that's where I was for most of the shows. And in one of the shows, I believe one of the first shows that you saw, I think, was in Birmingham uh, in December, and he actually uh, dedicated the first time ever I saw your face to you. Is that correct? Yes, that is a beautiful song. Yeah, it, it, it's amazing when I think back the power he had in his voice and being so close and watching him uh, on stage and uh, it, it was just it was really really magical and he gave us all for uh, each and every show. Some were weren't up to par as others were, but I thought the majority of them were really really great. Well, when he wasn't feeling ill, uh, sorry, when he was feeling ill or tired, he was, he still gave it his all. You could tell he was giving it his all, even when he wasn't, you know, the best. I mean, everybody gets tired and everybody gets sick, but you you know, most yeah, of absolutely. the time, most yeah. of the time, you wouldn't have realized with Elvis. You know, he he was he was a consummate professional. That's for sure. Uh, th yeah, this this would have been about the yeah, this would have been about the time of when. Um, Elvis, what happened? The the bodyguard book started. Uh, rumors started going around about that. Did did he discuss that with you? I just remember him in the very beginning, on tour, mentioning uh, that he had fired some bodyguards. Now I had no idea who these people were. Never had never met them, and he said uh, they had been causing a lot of lawsuits mm. for him. Mm. So I believe that's why Ed Parker, uh, his, uh, his karate, he call, Elvis called Ed Parker his high priest <laughs> in karate. Uh, <laughs> but he had other people helping out. But that was the story I heard in the very beginning. And that's all I, I knew. I didn't, whenever he mentioned their names, I just didn't know who they were. Hmm. But you, you I did, do now, but I didn't at the time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, you, you don't feel that he was uh, preoccupied over the book the whole time you, you, were, you were with him? No, I never felt that. Mm. I, I well, this didn't bring the book up to me. I believe it was in the summer of '77, and uh, some people said he saw a manuscript or he was told a, a, about uh, the book. But I never. Uh, I think that's one thing I wanted to clear up. And I was with Elvis pretty much every day. Mm. That he wasn't sitting around and depressed and 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 upset. I didn't see this, and I remember. But he was he was angry about the book and he was hurt. And he said, after all he'd done for their family, that they would turn and do this. Yeah. And I remember him saying to me, this was one night in the summer. He, I, I thought he came to a place, this is how I explain it, that he knew his real fans. This is what he told me. He knew his true fans would stand behind him. He said the majority of what the book is saying is not true. Um, and that's what, what had hurt him. And I've heard some different stories. I haven't read the book. I have no desire to read the book. But I thought, I, I just want to go by the Elvis that I loved and knew. And uh, 
I don't think it was right at all what was done. Um, but uh, he was he was looking forward to his next tour. He was ready to get out there, and uh, he said to me a few weeks before he passed away, he'd been on he'd been off too long. Mm. So he was ready to go out, and I knew he had to face some things. But I I couldn't tell. He didn't sit around and act really really down about it. Okay, um, there around about the turn of the year, um, you lost your grandfather. And yes. and Elvis made sure that you made it to, for your grandfather's funeral because the the weather was very very bad at, uh, around that time, wasn't it? Oh, it was. It was a scary situation, and I was just uh, so amazed that he had offered to come with me, and he said he'd really like to be here. And I believe we had just come back from yes, we had just come back from the tour, and I thought, well, he had to be tired, hmm. but. Uh, I, he knew I was going away and I was going to be away for a little bit and he wanted to go with us and he didn't just go with us. I remember thinking, where are we going to put him in the car? What do we do and all this? But he was so kind and generous and he offered to fly. Uh, my mother was already um, already in Arkansas at the time with, with my father. So uh, Elvis made sure that we uh, we all arrived for my grandfather's funeral. So he, he flew his small plane and my sisters my brother and his family and we were all on that so um it's something that will, will always mean a great deal to me it, it's it's a common theme uh when people talk about elvis presley uh people that knew him that how generous and kind-hearted he was uh and, and uh, again yeah. you know his actions like that are, are surrounding your grandfather's funeral just go to prove it i think Oh, absolutely, Steve. He he didn't have to do that. Mm. I mean, I would have been gone for a few days and come back. But the fact that he wanted to be there and uh, during the funeral, he he uh, uh, inside it was a small, small church that my grandfather had helped build. And uh, one of the ministers was up speaking and uh, his voice was a little shaky and all of a sudden, and he began to sing, and all of a sudden Elvis starts singing, and Charlie Hodge was with us, and Charlie starts harmonizing with Elvis inside the church. And uh, the minister relaxed a little, and that was a that was a really nice moment. Um, and afterwards, um, yeah. Oh, I, I was I just wanted to say just before or just after I believe the, the passing of your grandfather, there was the New Year's Eve concert in Pittsburgh. And uh, that was one of the the best um, of the later concerts that Elvis uh, did. You know, it, w it was a big highlight uh, in Elvis's career, that uh, New Year's Eve concert. So, uh, again, you see, you were saying people thought he was, like, depressed and, and ill all the time and everything like that. But just if, if you listen and you watch the, the concert, uh, it's available. It's like fan footage on YouTube. You know, it was it was an absolutely fabulous, right. Right. fabulous concert, that one. So. Yes, he, he did a great performance. But it's funny, if someone had mentioned it to me, you know, maybe three months after that, I wouldn't have noticed so much of a difference, as I said. I just was so excited at most of his shows and thought he did a great job. Hmm. Of course, you can see, you know, I said sometimes he put a little more movement into it than he did other times. But, uh, uh, yeah, it was definitely definitely a, a top show for sure, though. Hmm. So what I was going to say before I got sidetracked and going backwards a little bit to New Year's Eve concert was was um, on the 26th of January, uh, he proposed to you. Yes, he did. Um, now, uh, we, we, did, we did touch on the fact that he, he read a lot of numerology books and so forth. And uh, he, he probably, did he tell you this? I don't, I'm not sure whether he did tell you this or not. Did he um, consult uh, Cairo's book of numbers for the date that he proposed to you he never said anything to me about that someone else mentioned it um I can't explain why he picked the particular date some people read things into you know if they go by the numerology um, either way I was blessed that he asked me to marry him and it was a I, I remember the two of us were watching tv in Lisa's room and he got up and left, and he was gone for a while, and I heard some commotion going up and down the stairs and different people coming in and out. And at one point, he finally returned and took my hand and walked me through the dressing area into his bathroom and 
some people joke about the bathroom, but I said that was his part of his sanctuary a lot of the times where <laughs> I think he felt the most privacy. Yes. So there was a chair he pulled out. Uh, I sat down in it. And uh, next thing I knew, he got on bended knee and he said some really, really beautiful things to me and pulled a, a ring from a green box from behind his back and asked me to marry him. And it was a, a, a beautiful memory. It'll always be special in my heart. Uh, some people have, have wondered why, um, when Elvis asked you to move permanently into Graceland, you refused. Well, I, I remember when he asked, and I was 20 years old at the time. I had lived at home my whole life. I shared a bedroom with my sister. It just wasn't my way. I didn't feel it was something that certain people didn't do back then. And uh, I remember when I told him that, as much as I appreciated it, took me by surprise yeah. but his words to me were he understood and he said he respected me for that yeah and uh but i think i've gotten some flack but sometimes i think some of the the guys around him thought maybe i didn't really care for elvis because i didn't move in because they were certainly used to people moving in and who would most people would say who would turn down elvis mm. but didn't mean i didn't love him it was just it wasn't my way and um I felt he understood it at the time. I hope he did. He seemed to have and hmm. by his words, but uh, that was the reason. And Elvis being Elvis, as you just rightly said, he respected you for making that decision. So that's, that's fair enough. Um, then the recording sessions in, in Nashville, which uh, you, you did travel to Nashville, but he didn't go into the studio. Yes, that was, uh, you know, I, I, there were so many, I hate to say it, Steve, there's just so many lies out there. And I, and, and whoever started them, uh, biographers would pick up those lies and put in their books. I've seen it over and over again. Mm. Yes, I was with Elvis in Nashville. I went with him. It was said that I've seen books written that said he was pining away for Ginger, and she wasn't with him, and he's trying to call her. I was there. There was a local newspaper that wrote about the two of us being there mm -hmm. um, at the clipping. Uh, but anyway, uh, yes, his throat, um, he was very worried always about getting a sore throat. And uh, his throat started to bother him. Um, I heard him get up, and I, I heard someone playing guitar in the, uh, in, the, in the living room area of the suite we were in. And uh, then the music stopped. He came back in, and he just decided he was afraid for his throat. So uh, they canceled the session, and we flew back home, and he took care of his voice. And yeah, um, he suffered from tonsillitis when he was younger. And uh, when he became famous, uh, it was they thought, you know, maybe we should take his tonsils out. But nobody could guarantee his voice after his uh, the operation. So there was no way he would go ahead and have his tonsils out. Well, actually, I didn't know that. Thank you for enlightening me. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I, I remember I remember a story that he got really, really, really bad tonsillitis when he was in uh, Germany. Uh, okay. uh, and uh, uh, I remember a story as well when he was small that uh, he got a very, very bad uh, tonsillitis and Gladys and Vernon were so worried they were going to lose him because, of course, in those days there was no antibiotics and his fever, his, his fever was very, very, very high and they, pr they prayed and in the morning the fever had broken. But so, yes, I mean, he did suffer badly yeah. all the way through his life with a sore throat. Yeah, that would have been quite scary. I can can imagine. Um, yes, yeah, especially in Las Vegas because the air was so dry, the desert yeah. air. He was very concerned um, uh, about uh, because he always wanted to to, to uh, give the best in his shows, and so yeah, it was certainly something he, he, he that, that could be of concern to him at various times. Tell me about the uh, the vacation uh, in Hawaii in March. Uh, I remember we were sitting at Graceland and he asked me if I'd ever been to Hawaii. And I said, no. And he said, I'd really like to take you there sometime. So um, he actually invited my whole family. My mom couldn't go, and uh, uh, but my sister Terry and my sister Rosemary, myself. And wow, it, it escalated. Uh, about 28 other people. Uh, uh, Elvis flew his large plane, the Lisa Marie. So we all flew on that, and we were there, I think, about 10 days, and uh, it was so good to see him him relax. It was something he, he needed, and uh, um, I think he had a really nice time. Did he um, talk about making changes uh, after the tour that was in June? Um, 
there's been there's been talk that he was going to make changes in at the tail end of 1977 and some people said that he was talking to people in in Hawaii at the time about making changes do you remember him saying anything about making changes well I know he would be upset I could tell changes were in order with I think some of the people around definitely Hmm. Um, he would be upset at certain people and uh, just from what I personally witnessed uh, he wasn't happy about some things so I definitely felt changes were in order for him, and, and there were so many things he was looking forward to and, and wanted to do. Um, uh, I think he would always be singing, and that was just what he lived for and what he loved to do. But uh, he wanted to, to also do more serious films. Yeah. I know he wanted to perform in Europe. He talked about performing in Europe, and he joked one time saying, can you imagine if I sang, you know, if I'd have to sing from a cage if I go to England and... It's just uh, that would have been something to have seen. And it's just a shame he didn't get to do that. Was he planning on going to England? Uh, I don't know about any definite, but the fact that he had mentioned it to me, I thought, I think I think that would have eventually been something that yeah. that could have come about. It, it was obviously on his mind, so it, it could have been something sure. that happened. Yeah. Sure. Uh, w- one of the last t- times... Um, well, actually, the last time that Elvis was on television was for the CBS TV special, uh, which was recorded in June. Um, right. w- was he happy about that uh, television special? Was he nervous? or? Yeah, he was extremely, extremely nervous. And I think it was sprung on him where he didn't have a chance to lose a little weight. Um, Elvis was never fat, but just to lose a little more weight and be better prepared for it. Um but uh, I remember uh, when they did the uh, makeup uh, for him for this show, he came walking out. We were on the airplane. And I, I didn't think it looked good. It looked cakey. It looked, I thought he was so much more handsome without that thick makeup on. Mm. And, uh, uh, and I could tell when he was performing, uh, I mean, he, a lot of times the, the, the perspiration would get into his eyes and it would bother him afterward. And, um, uh, but, and he was definitely... He was definitely nervous about it. So, uh, and there were other shows. It's a shame they didn't film some other shows because the the couple of the shows that got filmed, there were some other performances that were better. Yeah. But unfortunately, those weren't filmed, and fans didn't get to see that. So they had this certain image, and which I felt was unfair. But they had this certain image that it's kind of forever stuck in their mind. It's like, but you should have seen the other show. Yes. And then even you know you didn't see him throughout the summer either. So it's. it's I felt for, I feel for him for that. Yeah, uh, particularly the last date of the tour, the very, very last performance in Indianapolis was supposed to be an extremely good concert. And as you say, it's just a pity that one wasn't filmed. Um, the, the I think there were film crews at the airport, but the the, the actual CBS cameras weren't uh, in the uh, in the Market right. Square Arena, unfortunately. Um, now. Uh, I've told you this prior to the interview, but I I just want to say this to the listeners. I've decided not to ask you about the events of August the 16th, uh, simply because they've been recounted so many times over the last four decades. Uh, I I mean, if if people want to know the details, they can get them, obviously, in your book. Uh, So, I I mean, just out of respect to yourself, uh, Elvis, and, of course, your late husband, Ron, who unfortunately, sadly passed away on the same date as Elvis some years later um, I, I've decided that, that there's no there's no real reason to to go over that ground again um, no, I, I appreciate that and it, and it took a lot to unfortunately I, I had to be fairly descriptive in my book about that day uh, as, as emotionally exhausting as it was to relive it but I had to do it because Steve there are so many untruths Mm. out there on that specific day and yeah. um so so i'm glad i i got it out there for uh, history's sake yeah so like i say if, if anybody needs to go over those details again they can they can find it all in your book anyway and uh another thing um uh, that uh, people latch on to is the actual lawsuit that your mother brought against the estate and, and again, uh, I feel that there's no real need to sort of drag all that up again. It's far too complex uh, within the realms of this interview. So again, they can find details of that in your book. Yes, thank you. But what I do want to ask you about is the events following Elvis's death 
uh, with Vernon, uh, newspaper article misquotes and so forth, and just things like incorrect reports like you were banned from Graceland. Yes, that that was a, 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 an untrue story that somehow got started. Um, I think it started with uh, Elvis had an Uncle Vester. And um, uh, it, it's interesting because he was misquoted. Uh, tabloid came over, interviewed him. He was misquoted. He did an interview later stating that he never said I was banned. And I thought, why was I banned? I didn't do anything. It was mm. just ridiculous. Mm. Uh, and I spoke with Elvis's father. I spoke with Mr. Presley about it. And he said, don't believe anything you hear unless you hear it directly from me. And he told me I was always welcome at Graceland. So that was a story. But because the tabloid got it out, that was a story that, that still to this day, I've seen people and it's like, that's not true. And it's like, you have to show them the article with the, the uncle that showed that he was misquoted and that he never said that. Yeah. It's just unfortunate for me, but I'm happy to clear that up. I was never banned from Graceland. Unfortunately, the media is known for twisting things around or, uh, as you say, just making things up to sell stories. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And it was at my expense, but, uh, but we lived through it. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. We rise above it. Um, rise above it. So, so life, life after Elvis, um, you, 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 you married and you have a son, uh, Hunter, I believe his name is. Yes. Yes. Very yeah, proud. He's, he's very proud of him. He's very proud. Uh, he's, um, uh, you know, he lost his father, uh, his senior year in college and, uh, we had a tough time there. So, uh, been about five years now so we're still navigating these new waters without my husband but uh uh yeah uh, i went forward in life and worked and and um uh, and i was proud of what i did and i didn't jump on the i call it the elvis bandwagon with all the books and um uh and i waited 38 years to write my book but it was something it, it had to be done and and the lies were so so outrageous. Some are pretty vile, and um, it just and there are even some new ones I see now. And it's just it, it it was something that had to be done. And I'm I'm so glad that I was able to get get it out there. Yeah, 2014. I can't believe it's that long ago. It doesn't seem that long ago. Time <laughs> t- time goes by so fast, doesn't it? It does. it does. What? How do you? I mean, this this mustn't make you feel very good either when you f- you feel that you're sort of being like airbrushed out of. Uh, Elvis history you know those last sort of nine months the to some people they just didn't exist anymore yeah I think it's it, it, I think it's unfair to a lot of people I mean not even just me it seems as if they try to airbrush from 1973 on out yeah. of his life yeah and I thought Elvis loved different people and he enjoyed himself and he was happy and I don't know why that isn't shown there's a different portrayal and it's an unjust one and i don't think it's fair because it's rewriting history um but uh i i have to blame myself for a lot i turned down many many interviews i didn't go on larry king i wasn't ready at the time and i didn't want to be bombarded about elvis's death and uh so i turned down a lot of shows and it's my own doing for for not being on those but i didn't want to be on a show that was going to portray elvis in a bad light, something I felt was unjust, and I didn't want to go down that path. And so I just avoided uh, many, many shows, and I turned down many interviews for books. And when you turn down interviews for books, they, that doesn't always go in your favor either. But that's why I thought uh, I had to write my own book and, and get it out there, and I'm, I'm so glad I did. What what do you think about the divisions that have sort of sprung up since Elvis's death? Do do you think that Elvis would be disappointed in a, in in some people the way they kind of uh, try to you know almost like sling mud on people? Oh, I think he'd be he'd be extremely angry. He'd be hurt. I mean, I've seen even family members say some things regarding him, and I thought, well, that's not what I witnessed. But I think it's terrible, and I. I've never understood people when he did so much for them hmm. that what was the point? What, why were some things said and was it necessary to say that? Why were some things exaggerated? Why were some things made up? I don't understand why these people he had taken care of their whole life, why people turned and did certain things. Um, and uh, he just had some interesting characters around him and I didn't think he needed 
the majority of the people around him, but uh, I, I felt for him because of that. I mean, it was something he never, ever deserved. Do you, do you think that he had a feeling sometimes that he didn't know uh, who his friends were? Were there people there just to just because he was Elvis and for what they could get? Oh, I, I think so. I mean, I came on the scene later, but uh, when I see some of the things that were done, you know, before I even came on the scene or what was not done to help, and, and it's, uh, it, it makes me sad for him. Um, I think he could have had a, a better group of people um, around uh, in regard to some of them. But he was happy. The time that you spent together, he was happy. He wasn't the sort of the, the, the sick, drug-addled, um, depressive that no, that the media no. try and make out. This was what Elvis was. It, it, yeah, that drives me crazy. And it makes me so sad for him. And, and I, I, it's, it's, it's that wrong image. And you can thank a select few, whether it be some family members or a, a, a friend um, that was put out there. And I thought, this is just, this just really saddens me. I mean, Elvis was at our home 10 days, my family home, 10 days before he passed. He was singing. Charlie was with him. He was at our piano, playing the piano, singing, having a great time. And I thought, this isn't someone that can't get out of bed. I wouldn't have been with Elvis if he couldn't get out of the bed. I mean, it was terrible. It's just this portrayal. We, we had many wonderful times. We laughed. We cried together. We watched TV. And, uh, you know, upstairs was his sanctuary. He felt relaxed up there and we were alone many times up there mm. unless someone popped in and if he needed something, but, uh, uh, he would play, there was an electric organ in his office and he would sing to me a lot uh, on that. And, and, uh, those are some special memories I'll always have as well. Uh, now, obviously you, you spent time with Lisa as well when she visited Graceland. And as we know, Lisa has been through uh, a bad time recently with uh, the loss of her son. Um, uh, if you if you could say if you could speak to Lisa Marie today, what 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 would you say to Lisa? Uh, well, yeah, my heart absolutely broke for her when I heard the news of her her son. I mean, it's it's, uh, it's, it's such a tragedy, and uh, she's she's got to be very very strong with that, and she's had a lot on her plate recently. So, um, uh, my thoughts and prayers are always with her, and uh, if she ever wants to know the truth about her father's last months. I'd be happy to speak with her. I always try to be there for her and um, I just wish her the best uh, going forward. It, it, it mustn't be easy being the daughter of somebody that was so massive in, in the world. You know, it's such a big, big um, influence on the 20th century. Well, it didn't help anything that she looks so much like her father. <laughs> I know. It's it's <laughs> unbelievable. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and, and uh, as I said, it, it's a, a strange world we live in sometimes, and I, I just hope that people left her alone and, and uh, let her be, and, and uh, you know, and I just, uh, as I said, I, I, I wish the best for her now, and um, she's got to go forward in life, and uh, I know a large part of her is missing with the death of her son, so... Uh, but my thoughts, again, my thoughts and prayers are yeah, better. Yeah, and I, I echo that as well. Now, uh, your book, um, Elvis and Ginger, uh, Elvis's fiance and last love finally tells her story. And I believe it's actually Amazon recommended. I saw that yes, the other day. Well, yay, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm very, I'm very proud of it. And as I said, emotionally, it, it took a lot out of me to write, but um, I'm grateful that I was able to, to get it out and, it makes me feel so good because a lot of people um, uh, have said I understand things so much better now, and um, and that makes that means the world to me. That makes me feel so great. And uh, people are understanding a lot of the lies told. You know, I, periodically I have to go on there, and uh, having moved on in my life, it allowed the lies to become the truth. Yeah. No one was countering that. No, and I didn't even I wasn't aware of a lot of the things that were being said. So uh, it's been a little bit of a battle, but I'm hoping to get a YouTube channel going and we're going to talk about some of those and and uh, try to straighten out a lot of this garbage that's been out there for quite a few years. Good. Very good. And you have an upcoming event this summer, I believe, don't you? Yes, yes. We're doing a, an evening with, with uh, Ginger Alden. Uh, so I'm, I'm looking forward to that. We'll be doing that in Memphis on August 12th. So uh, excited to get up and, and talk about a few things and, and hopefully clear a few things up as well. 
Yeah, uh, it's an evening with Ginger Alden, as you said, August the 12th, 2021. It's the uh, Sheraton Hotel, downtown Memphis, I believe. Yes, yes. Uh, it's sponsored by Elvis Matters and my friend uh, Jamie Kay from uh, the uh, Jungle Room podcast it will actually be talking yes. to you that night. Yes, yes. Jamie's going to be, Sarah Madison is hosting the event. So uh, we're, we're looking forward to it and we'll use all safety measures and, and um, yeah, we had to divide it into two shows because it, for, for uh, safe, safety issues with the virus uh, we're only allowed so many people in the the ballroom at once. So mm. now we've divided into two shows, so everybody can be spaced and it'll be safe for everybody. I'm going to provide a link to the the site where you can get tickets if you want uh, in the description box of this video for anybody that's interested. I'm sure there's still a few tickets left. I believe there are. Yeah, yeah. I believe there are. Yes. So so uh, it was sold out, and then some people, because we had to change it, of course we couldn't do it this past year because of, of the virus. So um, now I think there may be a few tickets that uh, Sarah Madison, as I said, the host, that she, she's selling. So that's great. Yeah. Um, we mentioned all, all the way through uh, the interview about Elvis and uh, his the books, you know, like Cairo's Book of Numbers and The Prophet and so forth and an impersonal life. And in the flyleaf of your book, there's a passage from one of the books. Um, I'd like to read it now. Uh, it says, when love beckons to you, follow him, though his ways are hard and steep. You give but little when you give of your possessions. It is when you give of yourself that you truly give. Khalil Gibran, the prophet. So I can n nearly hear Elvis's voice saying that. It must have meant a lot to him, that passage. We went over that book so many times. And uh, yes, it. Uh, I remember him saying that to me. When love beckons to you, follow him. Though the ways be hard and steep. And, uh, you know, he loved to teach. And so we, we spent so many hours going over so many of the books but uh the prophet was was one of the, his favorites at the time i'm sure you're glad you met elvis presley because as you say it changed your life forever oh absolutely i've had people say would you had it to do all over again i thought absolutely mm. I, I, even through the painful times and the and the publicity that was not the best at times i wouldn't i wouldn't have traded the love and uh the blessing to have gotten to know him for those last months, the fact that he allowed me and my family to be a part of it was a, a, a truly wonderful thing for us. And um, I was just uh, blessed to, to, to have been able to be at his side and try to help him and, and get to know him. Ginger, thanks very much for sharing uh, your memories of Elvis and, and spending this little time with me. It, it is much appreciated. Well, thank you, Steve. And uh, I hope uh, you, you keep well and safe through these troubled times because uh, it's still, you know, we're, we are getting the light at the end of the tunnel for this pandemic, but it's still a, a few months away yet, I believe. Oh, yes. So uh, everybody just mask up and <laughs> we'll get there. But it's just uh, everybody has to be safe. And I wish you the best, too, Steve. Thank you very much. Take care of okay, yourself. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye. Thanks once again to Ginger for joining me on the show today. Don't forget to check out the link in the description box below this video for an evening with Ginger Alden this August. A reminder to join me on Sundays for my live stream broadcasts on YouTube for Elvis Fan of the Week quiz, Elvis Song of the Week and a chance for fans to discuss all things Elvis. Thanks for listening, stay safe and I hope you can join me again for another episode from Elvis the Ultimate Fan Channel.